Welcome to an evening of storytelling. And I am the Reverend Dr. Natalie Fenimore, one of the ministers at the Unitarian Universalist Congregation at Shelter Rock. We welcome all people and their one of a kind life stories to our community. This pandemic has caused us to be isolated from one another, but we acknowledge, we know that we remain in deep need of one another. And we long to hear each other's voices, to hear each other's stories. Our congregation is so it pleased is to be able to host this gathering. this gathering. And we invite you to check out our website for the date of the in-person storytelling, which we will have in the fall. It'll be great to return to our beautiful buildings and grounds, and it'll be great to see all of you in person. I now turn things over to Tracy Sagara, who is a storyteller and story coach. Tracy's true stories have been broadcast on the Moth Radio Hour, the Story Collider, and Risk podcast. One of her greatest joys is working with first-time storytellers to help them to find and tell compelling stories from their own lives. So, Tracy. Yay, Tracy! <laughs> Welcome, everybody. It is so nice to see so many people virtually on Zoom to share storytelling, which is one of my most favorite things in the universe. Um, I think when we share our stories, we forge communities and um, we make connections with each other that are just um, incredible and wonderful and beautiful. And like the Reverend said, during this time, during the pandemic, connection has been so important and so difficult. But luckily, um, we have these stories and we have Zoom. And for the last six weeks, I've been working with a group of brand spanking new storytellers from the congregation. And they will be sharing stories with you tonight on the theme of worth. And we also have some guest storytellers with us tonight whose stories have been on the Moth Radio Hour, stories from the stage and other things. So we're just gonna mix it up. And to start off the evening, our, for, our first storyteller is Nina Lesiga. Nina, take it away. Hi everyone. The name of this story is called Uncovered. I've heard about the New York City no pants subway ride. It's an international day of silliness where people board a train and take off their pants in January. I've seen all kinds of photos and videos, but never a plus size person it looks like so much fun, but I didn't think I'd ever do it. I feared the public's reaction. Now I'm adventurous, I'm a solo traveler, and on a trip to Vietnam, I tell you, I hesitated big time. My tour guide came to my hotel on a motor scooter and asked me to hop right on. At 57 years old, I've never been in a, on a scooter, and I feared that we might tip over. I wasn't going to do it, but then she said with confidence, don't worry, I can handle you. I got on. I loved it. And I realized I had become overly cautious and it was time to bring bigger and better adventures into my life. On social media, I saw the invitation for the no pants ride. I replied, yes, but before I could change my mind, I called all my family and friends and invited them to ride along. One by one, they said the same thing. You're on your own. <laughs> this was important to me. I wanted to look good, so I started to begin to prepare my outfit. I marched right up to my panty drawer to assess its contents. There wasn't one pair suitable for this purpose. I needed to go shopping. Oh, and I brought home three pairs. I stood out of my, my bedroom, bedroom 
mirror with a digital camera in my hand and I took photos because I wanted to be sure that I saw what other people were seeing. <laughs> And I wanted to make sure it was a quality experience for all, for everybody. Well, I chose the leopard print silky panties with wide leg black pants. I took the railroad from my home in Connecticut to New York City to a public meeting point in a park. People welcomed me with open arms. They said, you can do this. And I thought to myself, I just spent three hours getting here. I am taken off my pants. <laughs> During orientation, I learned that it's not haphazard. We formed teams and each team was assigned a subway car. And each no pants soldier was assigned a, a, a stop to get off with their hat, their gloves, their coats, their scarves, and in their underpants. I was to take was to off take my off pants my and like it was the like most was the natural thing. thing in the world. And if anyone questioned what happened to my pants, I was to say something polite that didn't give out the, the stunt, like, I forgot mine. <laughs> Well, it was time for my team to go to the Houston Street Station, and there I met Bunny Man. He was tall, handsome, bearded, and he was wearing a kilt. Down in the platform, he had this brown paper bag under his arm, which he pulled out a bottle of pink champagne, which he expertly uncorked, took a big slug, and then passed the bottle to me not wanting to offend his kind act of hospitality, I drank too. On Sunday, the subways are notoriously delayed because of construction and rerouting. And this was no exception. When the train pulled up, it was horribly crowded. And I couldn't imagine how I could take off my pants in yes, such a state. And my heart my started heart. beating really, really loud as I thought, wait a minute. Sometime during my life, my mother told me not to get on a crowded train and take off your pants. <laughs> I watched in awe as my team members pushed their way into the car. And as I watched, the doors closed and the train pulled out and I was by myself on the platform. And I thought, you need to abort this mission now because when you get on the next train, you're gonna be the only one taking off their pants. And wouldn't you know, the next train came right away and there was plenty of room. So I didn't know what to do. I, I said, get on. And I held on to the pole and I looked to the right and I looked to the left. And then I took my thumb and stretched my elastic waistband and pulled the leg down, grabbed back onto the pole and then finished. To my left seated was an elderly Asian gentleman with shopping bags. The look on his face. <laughs> now I'm on everything. I was sure that everyone was staring and I glanced around. I was so surprised. I was so relieved. They weren't. I rode the jolting train in my underpants and I was feeling such bliss because for weeks I had worried unnecessarily about this ride. I got off at Union Square, that's 14th Street, where I joined hundreds of no pants riders where we celebrated and took Instagram photos on the no pants subway ride. Regardless of your size, everyone belongs. The only roadblocks were those that were in my head.
Thank you. <laughs> Woohoo! Awesome, Nina. When I heard this story, I said, Nina, you must tell this story on the show. And if anybody has shown that we are worthy to wear leopard underwear on the subway, it's Nina. <laughs> Nina, let me tell you about Nina. <laughs> Nina has performed for PBS's Stories from the Stage, Generation Women, and the Story Space. She is the host of the Bridgeport Art Trail Storytelling Exchange and is an organizer of the Pichacacha Night Bridgeport CT, a visual storytelling event. She sent me the pronunciation of that, so I hope I said that correctly. <laughs> Once again, let's give it up for Nina. All right, our next storyteller coming to the virtual stage is Angela Caesar. I'm sitting in the Dean's office at New York Theological Seminary, and she's explaining to me 10 years before, 10 days before graduation, why I'm not going to be able to graduate. It's, it's like a, a, a shot to my gut. I said, wait a minute, this can't be true. I spent seven years and $80,000 trying to become a chaplain. I, I, I'm determined to convince her right then and right now that this was going to happen. Let's go back to 1998. I was uh, finishing a 20 year career in healthcare administration, and I was looking for something more meaningful. So my minister suggested I consider chaplaincy. I've always been interested in end-of-life care uh, since I met Dr. Dr. Kubler-Ross. Kubler Ross. Oh, get a little feedback. But. <laughs> um, so I went to Calvary Hospital, which is a hospice-type facility, and I took the first of four units of clinical pastoral education, which is necessary to become a chaplain. It was wonderful, very memorable. After a six year hiatus, I find I'm in Westchester Medical Center and finishing the, the last three units of clinical pastoral education. I'm so excited because now I may get some type of chaplaincy job. I thought I was working a long time by then. Turns out, no, my supervisor and any job leads said that I'd have to go to seminary. Ugh, no way, no. Not seminary, three years of graduate school to get a master's degree. No, no, that's not for me. When I told my minister, Reverend Jennifer Brower, about it, she said, just take one course at Union Theological Seminary, her alma mater, and see how you like it. What do you have to lose? Well, on the two hour train ride into the city, I'm sitting there saying, what a waste of time. I'm, I'm going to prove everybody wrong who's telling me to do this. I walk into I Union, and it's a and sacred, it's place. sacred place. It feels like it a feels monastery, like a even though I've never been to a monastery before. There's a, a courtyard, beautiful green with a tree and benches, and it's surrounding by the Gothic buildings of, of Union. I'm taking an introduction to pastoral care. I loved it. Of course, I loved it. So <laughs> I decide now, well, I have to tell you this though, first of all, to tell you how much I loved it. I would wake up in the middle of the night and wished it was the morning so I could go to school. That's how much I loved it. Okay, so now where am I after that? In the fall, I decide I'm gonna take the plunge and go full time. Now this was a very different course overload situation. And I, I don't know because the students are very well versed in the Bible and the Quran and the Talmud, and I barely know the New Testament. So I, I'm getting a little nervous here. I'm sitting in systematic theology class and looking through the syllabus. And one of the readings was the beginnings of dialectical theology. Wow, I think I know what I have to do now. And I go over to my dorm, pick up some belongings and go back to Long Island. My husband says, well, take a break. I said, no, no, you don't understand. I'm leaving, I'm quitting union. This, this is not for me. When I thought I had the call to chaplaincy, God must've had the wrong number. So I quit. 
a year later, I'm back at Union and I stay this time for three years, but I'm going part time. And then I hit another wall and that wall was the master's thesis. I just didn't want to devote myself to that much at this time in my life. But then I'm in my chaplaincy group and, and one of my friends says, look, you can't let this all go. You, you've worked too hard. Just go across the street to New York Theological Seminary and see what it would take to get a degree there. What do you have to lose? Well, at this point, I had plenty to lose. I had invested a lot of time and energy into this. And I, no, I just, I just didn't want to let it go. So make the appointment with the dean. And she's telling me I need 10 more credits to get my degree there. Ha, huh, that's great. This is very doable. Okay, uh, I'm, I did that. And then 10 days before graduation, my advisor calls and says, there's been a mistake, you can't graduate. Now I'm back again in the Dean's office with my husband and she's explaining that that advisory meeting we had in December was just that. I was never formally admitted to MYTS. And she said, you'll need 14 more credits and 24, because 24 have to be on site. That's the rules. And I'm like, wait a minute, I did everything you told me to do. You have to let me graduate. I'm picturing my family coming, my friends. This is like, this is crazy. I soon find out that it's very clear the regulations are preventing her from doing any changes. And I'm devastated. I'm just devastated. What can I do now? I step back and I think of my compassionate communication training. It taught me empathy and it taught me to be empathic towards myself and to take care of myself. But right now I needed the empathy for someone else. I said to the Dean, I could hear myself saying, this must be hard for you. She puts her head in her hands and says, you have no idea. I've lost sleep over this. And I'm like, okay. So she continues to talk. Just take 14 credits this summer. Well, I'm looking over that course list and I'm saying, if I do this, I have to miss a vacation. I have to miss my friend's wedding. All the friends I promised I'd get together with. But you know, was this worth it? You know, I say to myself, and, and of course, the answer is yes. So I say, okay, I'll do it. And you know, those courses were among the most relevant to my ministry. For the past 10 years, I've been a chaplain at Mercy Medical Center. I've been with patients who are dying. I've comforted their families. I've walked with them through very dark places. I guess many years ago, I know now that when I got that call, God did get the right number. Thank you. Thank you so much, Angela. What a beautiful story. Let me tell you a little bit about Angela. Angela says some of her biggest life transforming events are becoming a mother, joining the UU congregation, getting married, keeping her high school friends as her best friends, and buying a microwave. <laughs> she also loves real life funny stories. Angela worked so hard on this story and it's just so beautiful. And I love that you went from hospital administration and all the twists and turns to be where you were meant to be. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, our next storyteller coming up is, we just call him the captain, but he is Captain Hugh Stevens. Captain, take it away. Good evening. Good evening. It's 1945. The war in Europe is over. I've just become an officer in the Merchant Marine after spending two and a half years as a sailor. I've got a beautiful new uniform with one gold stripe on it. I'm pretty full of myself. 
I'm assigned to an army hospital ship called the Jarrett Huddleston. And she's beautiful, long, all white, gleaming, big green stripe on her side, Red Cross, 60, 24 year old nurses, which I find quite intimidating, older women, you know. I've heard that the captain is nasty and mean, so I'm concerned about him. I'm concerned about the side of the ship. Can I handle it? And all my life, I've been ruled by women. <clears throat> my mother was a strong single parent. I went to <clears throat> Catholic boarding school and nuns wrapped my knuckles. <laughs> In all of my high school classes, I'd only had two males. So I've been governed by women all my life. And here I was with all these older women. How would I handle this? We were given orders to go to Cherbourg, France and pick up 500 nurses from MASH units. They've been on the Western Front for four years. So they were all 28, 30s. So now I had more women to intimidate me. <laughs> Cherbourg had been heavily bombed by the Allies. It was in shambles. We had to take a special pilot through a mine cleared channel, through sunken vessels. There weren't even enough spaces to tie our mooring lines to. We had to put them on temporary pilings driven into the bottom. The dock was full of bomb holes. We looked out and as far as the eye could see amidst the rain were ambulances, army trucks, jeeps, and 500 women descending on my ship that I was going to have to be in charge of. Rather frightening sight. They were all in combat gear, steel helmets, bed rolls over their packs so they looked like huge bears, combat boots. And this 21 year old was supposed to cope with this for an evening. At any rate, time went on the commanding officer of the nurses, the 500, decided they could go ashore with New Year's Eve. Our nurses could. This set up a very unhappy group of 500 nurses. So I was the youngest merchant officer, so I had to watch. I had maybe 10 MPs, no crew of my own, and 500 nurses who managed to find some liquor and were beginning to, uh, I could hear it from up above where I was. All of a sudden, fire alarm rang, 300 bells clanging in this ship, 500 nurses not knowing what to do, and one 21 year old wondering what the heck he was going to do. So quickly went to the bridge, look at the control panel, see where it was, it was back aft, Rushed with the MPs back aft, nothing there, nothing, false alarm. Get back and things calm down, off goes the alarm again. Right. This time up forward, we rush up forward, nothing there. So I realized these girls are going around with cigarette lighters, turning all these alarms in just to watch this kid run. Well, I'm wondering what to do about that. The alarm in the elevator goes off. And there are about 20 nurses in there and they're trapped. So of course, third mate Stevens has to go to the rescue. We get a ladder, try to open the doors, go down. The escape hatch in a elevator is a 18 by 18 inch opening in the ceiling of the elevator. I get the cover off it and I sit down with my feet hanging down and then I realized I'm gonna to have to let myself down on my elbows. And I'm beginning to let myself down and wondering when I'm gonna let go when all of a sudden I feel my belt being undone and my pants are pulled down around my ankles <laughs> by these happy girls. Now I've got to drop down in there to save my soul, so to speak, when I'm 
get down there, it's all just a big gag, right? They push me from one girl to the other just to um, watch this young kid squirm. Somebody presses a button in the elevator, down it goes, it opens up, and there, after an evening of drinking, stands my captain, Captain Archibald M. DeBoer. And he takes a look at me, and you know, I don't know if you've ever seen a uh, naval officer with a beautiful gold stripe and a nice officer's coat standing there in his boxer shorts with his name, rank, and serial number stanced on, stenciled on it, and guarders holding up his socks. You know, if you ever man looked stupid, that was it. Captain looks at me and says, Mr. Stevens, I don't see any future in this career for you at all. But I got even with him, right? He's dead. I'm a captain now. I've been a captain for 75 years. And uh, a month ago, I retired from uh, SUNY Maritime College as a captain at the age of 97. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing. So Hugh, you and you and Captain, you and Nina have to talk about, uh, you know, being pantless. You can relate. Um, that is incredible. And let me tell you a little bit about the captain. Captain Stevens is a merchant marine combat veteran of World War II. He rose to become a captain pilot and a marine safety engineer, owning his own company, providing safety programs and tank rescue equipment. And like he said, he spent the last 12 years of his career at SUNY Maritime College, just retiring last month at the age of 97 which is just incredible. And I asked the captain if he had a picture of himself as that young officer, and he does, and he's now gonna share it with us. So look closely at the captain's screen. This is. Look at him. Look at it, he's holding a sextant, apparently. That's a 21, and at 97, I collected some more medals and stuff. Awesome. And awesome. Look like that. Last wow. What a brilliant story. Love it. Thank you, Captain, so much. Our next storyteller coming to the virtual stage is Rebecca Mullers. Hi, good Hi. evening, everyone. Uh, so about eight years ago, I found myself living in upstate New York with my family in a little town called Ithaca. Um, I don't know if you know Ithaca, but it's a very outdoorsy kind of place, wilderness, waterfalls. And my kids did a program there called Primitive Pursuits. It's a nature immersion program. It was after school program, summer camp. It was an amazing program. And frankly, I was jealous. I was a stay at home mom. I put my career to the side. And I was really looking for that next adventure, that next something or other. I, the drudgery of being a stay-at-home mom was kind of getting to me. And, um, and I, I was jealous. So I enrolled in an adult program that they had called uh, what was for training to be a primitive, a wilderness skills instructor. Um, so here we were several weeks into the program. There's about 12 of us wilderness skills students uh, standing around in a circle, all holding a big stick. And this wasn't any stick, this was a digging stick. And a digging stick is a primitive tool you whittle to be able to dig up roots and wild edibles, you know, the primitive way. And it's about 18 inches long, about an inch and a half to two inches thick, no leaves on it. And our task that day um, was to identify what tree the stick came from. Now this had been a task for weeks and I had been failing miserably at identifying my tree. Uh, but here we were, this was do or die, figure out your tree. So we're standing in a circle and one of the instructors named Jed says, Rebecca, what is your tree for your stick? And I'm a little nervous, I'll be honest. I really had researched, but here I was standing with this group of homesteaders. And I don't know if you know about homesteaders, but they're an amazing bunch of people who live sustainably off the land, uh, you know, raising chickens and bees, living in tiny houses and log cabins that they've likely built themselves and probably whittling their own utensils. So this is an intimidating group for a suburban mom like me, who was a little outdoorsy. So here I am, Jed says, what's your tree? And I say, it's wild cherry. 
And he says, no. I said, okay, I got a backup. It's beach. He says, no again. So I flunked my stick. And I, you know, was semi devastated at the time because I had never flunked anything. Um, but, you know, I had to kind of, you know, brush it off and not let it get to me because I, had, I knew I had an even bigger challenge at hand. And that was to make fire. Now, this isn't making fire with matches and lighters and flint. This is the primitive way. Two sticks rubbing together to get a spark. This is a daunting task for a suburban gal like me. But, you know, I, I grew up in Ohio, um, camping, sailing, um, you know, I was the girl who would take the shortcut to school by teetering over the log, over the, over the, the creek, like Hick Huck Finn. Um, but, you know, I don't know if I can handle fire. Um, this was intense, but I am a can-do kind of person. I, um, you know, I'm a perfectionist and I'm like, okay, I can put my mind to anything, right? I'm kind of outdoorsy. So one day, it's a Wednesday, it's a beautiful sunny day. I put my three kids on the bus, so I have this window of time and I just, I'm determined this is the day I'm making fire. I had not made it, it'd been, this is now several months into the program. There's only a few weeks left. Almost everyone had made the fire but me. And, you know, remedial uh, wilderness student. And I was determined not to flunk fire. So I go into the backyard onto the patio and I've got my friction fire kit. So when you're making fire the, the old fashioned way uh, yourself, you use what's called a bow drilled kit. And there's three parts to it. Um, there's a bow, this kind of like a bow and arrow. It's a curved stick with a rope. And then there's a spindle, which is a tall skinny stick that you whittle to be round and pointed at the end. And then there is a um, baseboard and that's like a little uh, skinny plank of wood. And the idea is to use your bow in like a sawing motion to spin your spindle into your baseboard to create friction, right? Friction fire. The friction creates heat. You get this little pile of sawdust that forms a coal. It gets very hot in the middle and that is your source of your fire. Easy, right? Well, there is a technique to it and it's a little bit tricky, but here I go. I'm gonna go for it, right? So I start sawing away. I'm kneeling on my baseboard and I'm sawing away on my patio and it's glorious. I feel like mother earth. I am finally taking time out to do this. You know, the kids are away and I smell the smell of the burning pine and it's just amazing. And there's this squeaky sound that happens when the wood, the wood is squeaking wood on wood. It sounds just like the instructors. I'm like, this is it, I'm doing it. And I keep sawing and I get smoke, 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 more smoke, more smoke and nothing but smoke, smoke, smoke. No beautiful burning coal, um, just a bunch of pile of sawdust. And I am getting, you know, my, my, uh, my feelings of elation of being Mother Earth are slowly sort of dissipating. And I realize I, I just don't know if I can even do this. Um, so I, this goes on for hours. I mean, literally hours. I'm sawing and sawing and it's smoke and smoke. And at one point I'm like, just exhausted. I'm sweating buckets. My arm is gonna fall off. My knees are killing me and all of the glory is over. So I stop and I say to myself, what would Jason do? Now, Jason is one of the wilderness skills instructors at Primitive Pursuits and he is beyond a homesteader. He literally wears animal skins every day. <laughs> Like, and you know that he hunted those animals, he tanned the hides and he sewed the clothing. I mean, this is intense and amazing. So I so said, what would Jason say? What would he do? And I knew that what he would say is slow down. You're too intense. Put the perfectionism to the side, get focused, get in the moment and start again. Okay, so I take a full five minutes and I just am Zen for a little bit and I take a full five minutes and I start up again, this time with really great technique. Well, I also take a little glance at my watch and I realize I've got about 17 minutes till the kids get off the bus. Well, <laughs> I am in panic mode because I have to make fire today but I am gonna stay focused. So I start sawing away 
And within five minutes, I get an amazing, enormous call. My first call of the day. It's so exciting. It's incredible. So I slowly shepherd my call over to my Tinder bundle, which is this beautiful little nest of dry natural materials. And it's supposed to spark into a flame. So I'm blowing on it. And what do you think, believe is going to happen? But all of a sudden, a huge burst of wind goes flying by. And all of my beautiful coal scatters across the whole patio. Okay, I've been here before, but I am not going to flunk fire. So I start again, right? This time with the precision of a surgeon and I'm going, I'm going within two minutes, I get another coal. <laughs> but honestly, at this point, there's probably six minutes, maybe five minutes left to the kids gonna get off the bus. So I'm panicking, but I don't, I, I don't have time for another coal. So I envelop my entire body around this coal, my little baby coal to protect it from the wind. Cause that is not going to happen this time. And I shepherd it into my little tinder bundle and I'm blowing gently on it on the bottom. And these beautiful flames come flying out of it but I know I have maybe 20 seconds before it's gonna go out and the wind is still my enemy. So as I'm slowly pouring it into my fire pit that has my little TP of sticks ready to ignite into a full blown fire, what do I hear but the squeaks of the brakes on the school bus. The bus is out front, the kids are gonna get off and I have to go out and meet them. And my baby, my baby is, is just, just getting started. Start. Oh, I'm getting feedback. So I have no choice. I have to get out there. I ignite my little teepee. I race out to the street in front of the house just as the kids are stepping off the school bus. And I raise my arms in the, in the air and I say, Mommy made fire! And my kids know exactly what's going on. They start squealing and running down the street. The entire school bus of kids are plastered against the window looking like, what is this crazy lady doing? But my kids know exactly. So we all race to the backyard and from a gift from the heavens, my fire is still going. I can't believe it. And so I start barking orders at my kids. Josh, go get the apples from the kitchen. Annabelle, go get the marshmallow sticks from the shed. My little guy, Harry, go start picking up little baby sticks. We have to feed the fire. We have to keep it going. And I said, we have to make it useful. We're gonna roast apples. And it was a glorious moment. And we had so much fun roasting apples. And I will never, ever, ever forget how it felt that day. I felt, if I can put it into one word, I felt empowerment. It was complete empowerment that I had mastered fire from some pieces of wood that I found in the forest. And I showed my children that you can, you know, accomplish anything you put your mind to. And two years later, I was back on Long Island, co-founding Long Island's newest nature center, where every day we empower people of all ages to be connected to the natural world. Thank you. Yay. Go, Rebecca. Make it fire. I was with you all the way. I was just like, make that fire, make that fire. Let me tell oh, you about it. I forgot to say my my stick. It was actually a young red maple tree. I uh, I did it. Right, there we go. Stick wise. Now I, we I, know. Yeah. It's a good good digging stick. <laughs> all right. Let me tell you about Rebecca. Rebecca is a Long Island transplant who grew up in the suburbs of Ohio. A novice storyteller, but a wonderful one. She loves the outdoors, travel, and spending time with her family. Rebecca is always ready for an adventure that might lead to a good story. Awesome, Rebecca. Our next storyteller coming up to the virtual stage is Danusha Trevino. Take it away, Danusha. When I finally admitted to my therapist, Joan, that I was delivering drugs for a living, she calmly looked at me and said, maybe it's time to look for a more regular line of work. Regular. I grew up with a father who believed that there is nothing more horrible that can happen to anybody than to become one of those nine to five people. He often sat by the window in our kitchen in Poland and would point at our neighbors going to work and would say, look at these poor, poor folks. 
somebody's going to tell them when to sneeze, when to take their lunch or bathroom break, or when to take their lousy 14 days a year vacation. My parents were farmers and they worked more than eight hour days, never took vacations, but my father said we were free. Maybe that is why after graduating NYU, I became a waitress. And I was getting fired from most of those restaurants and cafes because I was a lousy server. I hardly made any tips and to uh, help myself, I cheated a little. I would packet the coffee money or steal toilet paper from the supply closet. Um, even though I barely paid my bills, uh, I thought it was all worth it. As long as the hours were not regular, I was free. Finally, after getting fired from yet another restaurant job, when the opportunity came, I started delivering drugs all over Manhattan. Um, there was a part of me that knew I was crossing a line, um, but I was very good at convincing myself otherwise. Um, and um, that um, I, I was I was very smart. Um, I could maybe uh, write a book about it. I mean, who else could better observe the CD underground life of New York? The money was also really great. Uh, I finally was able to buy the designer mini dress that I was eyeing for a month at Barney's. Um, and that went on for about six years. Um, and I don't remember exactly at one point I started feeling that I was miserably failing the promise of my life. And anything good that I ever did before didn't amount to much. I must have mentioned that to, uh, in one of our sessions to Joan, because she said getting a normal job would be a great start to raise up your self-esteem and self-worth. Um, I said, uh, yes, that's a very good idea, but how do you expect I find any motivation to look for a 40 hours a week, probably, um, you know, minimum wage job when I'm making more than a thousand dollars in just two days work. Pray for willingness, John said. She clearly was a woman of faith. And I thought to myself, sure, I will pray to some God, but fat chance I will ever want to look for work. And I didn't have to do anything for the next two weeks because I was going with my punk band to LA. Uh, in LA, I attended a meditation group because John said that would calm me a little. And I needed a ride back to my hotel. And that's how I met Sabrina. Sabrina said, said I will take you back, uh, but you will have to go with me to the supermarket to help my shopping. Sabrina was a young woman with short blonde hair. She was wearing a uh, leopard skin, uh, summer dress, had a, a dragon tattoo on her neck and had a very impressive size chest. When I asked her what kind of help I was gonna give her at the supermarket, she gave me a bit of her life story. Uh, she said, I used to be a stripper uh, for many years and all I had to do is walk into a club unbutton my blouse and voila, interview and uh, resume all at one. But supermarkets overwhelmed me. I learned also that she was making much more money than I ever did. And she quit all that to become a cashier, full-time cashier at a music store making $5 an hour. When we got to the supermarket, she was dancing between the aisles like a little happy kid while looking through her neatly arranged coupons. And every time she matched the coupon with the product on a shelf, she looked at me and said, isn't this so much fun? Uh, 
Um, on the way back, she took me to her job because she wanted to introduce me to her coworkers. She also showed me with pride the seat that she was sitting at, at, at the register. Looking at her, you would think she won a lottery. And I never imagined that I would ever be eager to go back to New York so I could look for a job, but that's what exactly happened. I wanted to be like Sabrina with all the coupons and all. So when I got back to New York, I was still terrified because I didn't believe that anybody's gonna wanna hire me. Well, Joan said to that, don't worry about that. You just fill applications, let your angels handle the rest. So I put on very comfortable shoes one day and I walked up and down Manhattan, applying to every type of store, uh, copy shops, movie theaters, travel agencies, even places that weren't uh, advertising for work. When I got home in the evening, exhausted, still without a job, I walked into my apartment and I saw my niece on the phone. She was about to hang up when she said, wait, I think my aunt is looking for work. The woman on the other line said, I am looking for a full-time nanny for my one-year-old son. I asked her, how much are you going to pay? Knowing that I have to match the carefully designed budget that me and John put together of $350 a week so I could pay for my living expenses and therapy. She said, how about $350 a week? I almost fell off the couch. I asked, where do you live? She said, Tompkins Square, 10th Street. I lived one block away on Avenue B. And the first day when I met that little boy, the family was going uh, to a magic show. After they left, I took him in my arms and we sat on a window overlooking the park. Um, the snow covered the trees and he looked at me and took a big breath and fell asleep right on my chest. And I looked at him and I quietly whispered, hey, little buddy, it looks like I'm gonna be growing up with you for a little while now. That's it, thank you. Danusha, what a beautiful, beautiful story. That is a new story. Danusha has never told that story before. And I'm so glad that we were all blessed to hear it today. Let me tell you a little bit about Danusha. Danusha is an actress, playwright, and a storyteller. She is a two-time Moth Grand Slam winner, and she is a regular at the Moth main stage shows. Thank you so much, Danusha, for that story. Oh, picture of that little boy. Oh. Amazing. All right, our next storyteller is Scott Barbet. Take it away, Scott. So three years ago, I am standing in the Long Island Blood Donation Center with my middle daughter, Sarah. Um, I've raised my kids with the belief of deeds, not words, and she's really taken to it. She really believes in the worth of deeds. And so we've been donating blood pretty much straight on for four or five years now. And we've got our gallon club cards out because apparently we've donated a gallon again this year and we're registering to do the donation. And the receptionist looks up and says, hey, John. Well, I turn around and my friend John is standing right behind me. John's a really interesting guy. He can be a little gruff, but um, He's really got a big heart. And I, I look at him, I say, why does the receptionist know who you are? And John just says, oh, I, I donate every now and again. And the receptionist says, actually, John's one of our 10 largest donors on Long Island. And he does blood plasma. He's done it for um, 10 years running, I think pretty much since 9-11. I turn around and look at John, somewhat stunned. And John says to me, eh, help some people. I'm good with that. Well, three months later, I'm playing poker with my friends in my basement. We have a monthly poker game. John is pillaging me. He's taking all my money. He always takes all my money. He's pulling in a big pot of my money, largely, 
to his um, earnings. And he says, you know, Ricard knows Ricardo's going to need a kidney. Ricardo is somebody I know at best in passing. Ricardo is John's former girlfriend's son. He's in his 20s. He's a nice enough guy. I've said, met him at a few Super Bowl parties. Um, apparently, he's immunocompromised. His mother has lupus, so can't do anything to help. And John has a history of cancer in his family. So this guy really has nobody to help him out with his this kidney issue. And I blurt out, I'll give him a kidney. I uh, sometimes I make what could be deemed rash decisions. Um, I, I don't. I, I would say I make quick decisions. Um, I can just make a decision and think, well, why not? And I tend to stick with them. Um, for anyone on this uh, Zoom event, when it comes to organ donation, you might want to consider it a little bit more, especially if a loved one's involved. So um, over the course of the next six months, I'm getting all these tests and battery of tests, and I'm running into Ricardo here and there. I'm going into one test. He's coming out of another test. I say hi. We're not really communicating, but, um, you know, they're making sure that everything is right. And every friend, every acquaintance, everybody I run into is saying, why are you doing this? You barely know this guy, your best friend's former girlfriend's son. And I don't have a good answer. Um, I don't, I don't want to say I'm dismissive of it, but I'm, I'm, I'm so casual on the issue that, uh, the best way to describe how casual I am is I'm in advertising and I keep thinking about the Twix candy bar campaign and their tagline is two for me, none for you. And it's funny and it's sarcastic and I love it in advertising. But if I'm thinking about somebody that needs a kidney and a vital organ donation, I'm personally feeling that humanity could probably do a little better. And uh, the fact that I'm an atheist, um, if when I die, I go up and there is a heaven and there's a pearly gates and there's a guy there and he's got a checklist, I'm thinking I get to the front of the line. I just say, I donated a kidney and, and maybe it'll work out for me. So the six months is over. Um, I'm at New York Presbyterian in my blue hospital gown and it's a cold winter morning and I'm about to donate a kidney. I'm there. My wife is there. John his former girlfriend, Ricardo's mother, and Ricardo is there, and we're about to do this. Um, I should make it clear that Ricardo is not getting my kidney. Um, days gone by, it used to be, oh, you need a, a vital organ. I hope you have a brother or a sister. It was not a very complicated system. Now they do this thing called a kidney chain where, or an organ donation chain where they get down to the insanely detailed genetic minutia of what your body systems are. And my organ, my kidney is going to go to a mystery woman in Ohio. There's a lot of anonymous aspects of donation. In turn, she's going to have somebody who donates kidney to the next person. In turn, they're going to have a donation. And, blah, 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 blah. and it comes back and Ricardo gets this wonderfully, perfectly matched kidney for himself. So in we go. And six hours later, I wake up. And, you know, I'm a pound lighter. I'm not feeling wonderful, but it's manageable. And I get a, I get a text and it's, it's the weirdest text I've ever gotten in my life. It says, thank you. My son just peed for the first time in eight years. Well, um, the nurse wants me to walk around and, and I think I'll, I'll go downstairs and talk to Ricardo's mom who has sent this text to me. I go downstairs and I'm talking to Ricardo's mom and I'm suddenly realizing that I have done this and I have known nothing about Ricardo, nothing. Um, your creatine level, which registers how healthy a kidney is, if you're a healthy person in this audience is likely around a one, nine, a two, four. If you're unhealthy and you're in bad shape and you need to get on dialysis, you're likely in the fours or fives, maybe six. Ricardo was at 19. He had been at 19 for years. His blood was basically poison. I had thought maybe he had dialysis 
once a month, twice a month. He was in dialysis for years, four times a week. And uh, this wave of shame came over me because, yeah, I donated a kidney, but through this whole time, I had never thought to get to know him, to understand what his need was. And it dawned on me, I wasn't concerned about his suffering because I didn't have suffering. I, I was not being a, this empathetic person. Words, not deeds, great, but the words would have certainly helped. I go back upstairs. Ricardo's still kind of unconscious. It's tough to receive a kidney. It's fairly easy to donate a kidney. The nurse an hour later wants us to walk around again. They're these tough Jamaican nurses. They're wonderful. Come on, you've got to get up. You've got to get up. And, and I say, you know, I don't know if I want to walk. And I get this call from the lower floor and Ricardo's apparently up and he's walking. And I said, you know what? Maybe we could dance. And the Jamaican nurse uh, thinks I'm basically crazy. And she says, okay, fine, you're crazy. And she goes to the nurse's station. She gets her boom box. We go downstairs. And uh, there's Ricardo in his blue robe and his IV stand. And I've got my IV stand and I'm in my blue robe and we both look really stupid. And the nurse puts on her boom box and she's got a cassette and Bob Marley starts playing. And Ricardo and I are dancing in this hallway to, uh, could this be love? Could this be love? And uh, suddenly everything is okay again, because I see that it's gonna be okay for him. Two years later, I'm fine. I still donate blood with my daughter. John's fine. He's still stealing money from me every month. Um, Ricardo and the lovely anonymous mystery woman in Ohio are apparently fine. And when people ask me, why did you donate a kidney? I think of my friend, John, and I say, helps a few people. I'm good with that. Beautiful, beautiful. Scott, thank you so much for your story. Every time Scott tells that story, he gets choked up. And those that's what happens when we refeel the stories and the stories that really impacted our lives. So thank you so much, Scott, for sharing that story. Let me tell you a little bit about Scott. Scott has been a member of UUCSR for 20 years. He likes to point out that he's an atheist who teaches religious education. So that means he's an enigma living in a riddle wrapped in a mystery. He works as a creative director in advertising, is a hubby to his lovely wife, Claudia, a dad to four kids, and a slave to his very needy dog and cat. Thank you again, Scott, for your story. Coming up now, we have Susan Roberts. Take it away, Susan. Uh, and I apologize for my barking dogs. They didn't bark until I unmuted. So I'm driving down the interstate, uh, riding down the interstate in Tucson, I-10 in Tucson, Arizona. And the guy behind the wheel is this very handsome, very cheerful, former executive with brain damage. Now, I'm not completely helpless in this situation because I'm an adaptive driving instructor. And I have my own brake on my side of the car. And also I have um, a mirror so that I can see the 18 wheelers that are bearing down on us. And who knew when I started my career in occupational therapy that it could get so exciting and so dangerous. But I like this job because it's a great distraction. And this has not been a great year for me. I uh, just turned 40. My mom died. I had a very painful breakup with my girlfriend of 10 years. I've moved a couple of times. And in the process of getting vetted by a motor vehicle department for this job, I also lost my license for a month. And I got to, um, experience that as well. So I 
am, um, I have gotten to spend three hours with this guy. And during the first, and, and, and all the time we spent together, he must have told me 25 times. That's a nice shirt you have on, Susan. And most of those times were in the first 15 minutes that I met him. So in addition to his medical records, I have determined that he's got a memory deficit. So, but as I say, I really like this job. I get a chance to meet and I get a chance to spend time with clients. And in the course of testing their coordination and their strength and range of motion and their vision and their perception and reasoning skills and, and a number of other things, reaction times, we spend about 90 minutes. And during this 90 minutes that before we go out on the road, I get to hear a little bit about their stories. And Bob, the driver that I'm out with, he um, was a high level executive for a big corporate uh, company housed in Tucson. And one morning as he was in the shower, getting ready to go to his work in the big corner office, he had a blood vessel burst in his brain. And by the time his wife found him, he was pretty far gone. So, you know, they, they came, they took him to the hospital. And while he was in the hospital, his wife took the house, the cars, the teenage kids no longer speak to him. And he is now living with his sister and brother-in-law and working at McDonald's where he washes the floors and wipes the tables because um, his employer will let him carry a list in his pocket of what he needs to do every day because he can't remember. So I look at him and I say, how come you're so cheerful? Like, why aren't you angry? And he says to me, well, I've had a lot of therapy and my sister and I are taking lessons, two-stepping lessons. I'm gonna start two-stepping to country music. And I think, wow. Who knew the power of country music and two-stepping? So um, another thing I like about this job is getting to tell people that they can drive again. You know, they've had a stroke, an amputation, um, various other kinds of things can happen to people. And then they, you get back to driving. And that's a great thing. It's a great thing. And I really like that part of it. But there's also this other side where I have to tell people they can't drive, that they're not safe. Uh, to drive and and take away their last shred of dignity and independence. And I also know what it's like to ride the public transportation system in Tucson because while I had no license, I never went anywhere that didn't have at least one transfer and every one of those transfers took um, at least uh, 30 to 60 minutes. And I might add, since this is a lot of New Yorkers here, what I got caught with was a moving violation, six years and three states moved away um, from the Bronx. So I made an illegal left turn in the Bronx, six years later catches up to me. And I put that on the list of, of, of shocking up this year, I'm turning 40. So we are getting off the highway and getting on Grant Road on our way back to the hospital. And so far, Bob's doing really good. And we make it past the bar where a previous client had just turned into the parking lot before he had a seizure. And still things are going good. And we get all the way back to the hospital and back in the parking lot and everything's good. But I'm still not sure about Bob. And you know, I was giving him directions, but what's gonna happen? Can he find his own way around Tucson? So I schedule him for one more visit and we, drive around Tucson and he can find his way around. And I'm really happy we go back to the hospital this after the second visit. And I say to his brother-in-law, he's safe to drive, he's great, he's a great driver. And his brother-in-law looks at me and says, would you let him drive your car? And I say, yes. Now I have a junky car and I loan it to anybody, but I say yes. And he looks skeptical and Bob and he go off into the sunset. And I wonder, you know, occasionally Bob's driving around. And then one day I go into the Hungry Fox restaurant for breakfast. 
I see Bob and he remembers me and my nice shirt and my name. And we talk and he says, hey, I got to take you out in the parking lot and show you my new car. So we go out into the parking lot and his new car looks a lot like my car, new to him. And in the windshield, in the windshield is the, the regulation wind sunscreen that everybody in Tucson, you don't drive in the summer without a sunscreen. And his sunscreen says, of all the things I've lost, I miss my mind the most. And I laugh and he laughs and he, I'm choking back a little bit of tears, but we laugh together and he says, a lot of people don't get it, but I knew you'd get it. And we go back into the um, restaurant and he goes with his friends and I go off with mine. And I think, wow, what can't you do with a little bit of humor? A therapy session or two or 10 or five, 10 or 20. And, um, and two step into country music. So over the following days, I reflect some on what I've lost over the past year and, and what I still have. And I pick up the phone and make an appointment to see a therapist. And then I call up a couple of my buddies. I get, and my girls, I say, say get, your, get, your, get your hat get your and get your boots. We're going out country dancing. Awesome. Thank you so much, Susan. What a lovely story. Such a great story. All right, let me tell you about Susan. Born in Los Angeles, Susan has lived and worked all over the United States. She currently lives with her wife and two dogs, splitting their time between Queens, New York, and a hundred-year-old camp her grandfather built on Torsi Bond Pond in Mount Vernon, Maine. Um, if you'd like to know more about Susan, you can visit her website, www.susanlroberts.com. Thank you again, Susan. All right, we have one more storyteller, then we're going to um, have somebody say a few words. And then if you'd like to stick around for a Q&A with the storytellers, we will do that afterwards. And now I present to you our final storyteller of the evening, my good friend, Richard Cardilla. Thank you thank so you. much, Tracy, and thank you all the storytellers tonight. What amazing stories. In um, 1976, I was 16 years old. So go ahead, do the math. You can figure I'm 63 this year. In 1976, when I turned 16, I made this profound decision that I was going to deliver my life to Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary and join a monastery of an order of Catholic teaching brothers and become a monk. Because every 16 year old knows what they wanna do for the rest of their lives. I was out to change the world. I was out to change myself. 40 years of difference now makes me see what I was really out to do was repress these crazy notions in my head of why do these guys always look better to me than girls? And I was so afraid of that, I entered the monastery. And that's where I went. More than anything, more than all of that, I had this desire to have secret knowledge of life. The Greeks used to call it gnosis. But I wanted to have this secret knowledge where I could tap into that and then find the secret to eternal life. So that was like the quest that I was on for my whole life. I go into the formation. I go into that first year. It's called a postulancy. And you learn the ins and outs of what it takes to live this kind of life. The second year, you're a novice. And I always used to say, well, yeah, I was just like, you know, Maria von Trapp, except when she left, she got to keep the guitar. I got nothing. So she, <laughs> but I'm in the novitiate and they're teaching me how to live the vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience forever in front of hundreds of people at the end of that year. And the superior general and dignitaries from the Vatican, you sign this form that says, I promise and pray that with the faith of God, I will observe my vows forever. They then rip that form out of your hand. They put it into a frame. They take it to your cell. 
not a prison cell, but it felt like that. They take it to your cell, they put it up on the wall, and that's the first thing you're supposed to see when you wake up in the morning, and it's the last thing you're supposed to see when you go to bed at night. I used to revel in the fact that my novice master would say over and over, when you sign on that dotted line, you signed up for everything. I don't have time for any monk that says, I didn't sign up for this, so I signed up for everything. I quickly got assigned to my first job teaching. I was in an all boys Catholic high school in Harlem, New York, and I was assigned to do all of those things. And I signed up for that a young monk would do in his first year of teaching, Te teach six classes a day, run the student council, coach the track team, run the parish bingo every week, and then go for your grad degree at night. So this was all I had to do. Then my superior brother, Joe, comes up to me and he says, I have a new charge for you you will be given the task of being the major caregiver for our oldest brother in the community, Brother Gus. I was the youngest of a community of 17, and Brother Gus was the oldest. Brother Gus was a 92-year-old monk from County Kerry, Ireland. He was this, he wasn't your Barry Fitzgerald type at all. <laughs> he was this cross between a relatively sainted man, a funny curmudgeon, and a vicious prick. That man, <laughs> that man had it out for me. He rode me every day. His nickname was for me was, oh, you fucking shite. And he'd call me that every morning after morning prayer, saying how much we're going to dedicate our lives to Jesus, we then go in to have our breakfast and he'd have his cup of tea, finish it and say, oh, yeah, fucking shite. And he'd spit in the teacup every morning. Even more than that, I had to take care of his most important passion in life. Because you see, Brother Gus, at the age of 92, was mostly noted for raising cactus gardens. I know it sounds a little bit crazy, too good to be true, but it was true. He raised cactus gardens. We built the man a greenhouse on the top of the roof in the school in Harlem. He was uh, interviewed by other botanists and in magazines and TVs and newspapers. He knew his stuff and he rode me with that. He'd say, you must go up there this afternoon and move cacti number, cactus number 12, a quarter inch. You must go there and with cactus 24, give them this thimble full of water. And I would do this and I didn't know if it was real or what. It was just craziness. He would revel. He would. Re oh, one of the things I used to hate to do was at night because he was such a heavy drinker as well. I'd have to go to his room after all of these things and I'd have to say the rosary. But just so that he can get his last scotch of the night in, he would want me to do speed rosary, speed rosary with him every night. Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Hail Mary, Holy Mary, Glory be our Father, Hail Mary, Holy Mary. And I'd pull my hair out when I had it. I didn't know if this was true, if this was for real, or if he was just riding me. It was amazing. He would take such delight in saying to me, ah, uh, Brother Mark, by the way, you're right. my name's Richard. It says it right there. But for 14 years, I had to change my name in the monastery. So my name was Brother Mark for 14 years. And I'm only finding out now at the age of 63 why you do that. It's so that later on in life, you can pay like thousands of dollars in therapy bills trying to figure out identity issues <laughs> in your life. But he said, nobody will get the secret. The secret of my cacti die with me. I will be the keeper of the secret knowledge. Fine with me. I never wanted to grow cactus anyway. I wanted to be with guys. <laughs> Brother Gus was a lifelong smoker. And sure enough, he comes down with a diagnosis of, of lung cancer. And he's told he only has about two more months to live. He chose to die in the monastery. So I had to up my game now. I was taking care of bathing him and dressing him and saying his special prayers with him. He wanted me to take care of him every step of the way. About a week before he died, he called me over to his bed and he said, Brother Mark, I've changed my mind. I'm going to give you the secret to the cacti, but you must not read it until I die. See the superior for the letter. 
A week later, he dies. He died. I prepared his body for burial. I helped inter his body at the brother's plot, cemetery plot in upstate New York. I came back to do my jobs at the school. And Brother Joe comes to the door, my superior, and he says, Brother Mark, there's a letter for you. I have the secret knowledge. I open that. And in the most beautiful script, it was just like calligraphy. I read this in the year of 1980, I commend these secrets to Brother Mark. Number one, every day before morning prayer, go out to the kiosk on the corner of 124th and Lenox and buy the New York Times National Edition. Number two, Go up to your cell after morning prayer and turn to the National Weather Service report. Number three, read the National Weather Service report carefully. And when it rains in Phoenix, Arizona, water the cactus. Again, is he playing games with me or not? I'm 63. I just lived a wonderful life. I think back to those times. In fact, this year I'm celebrating. I got married for the first time in my life, 63 years old, and my husband is 73. So we are doing great. But I think back now to secret knowledge, and I have no use for any secret knowledge anymore. I want open knowledge. For me, secret knowledge is just about as significant as when it rains in Phoenix, Arizona. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Woohoo! What a fabulous story, Richard. Rich has been a storyteller for the last five years and has performed at numerous venues and storytelling shows, as well as his solo show, show that has toured at fringe festivals throughout the country. Rich has been an educator for 35 years, and still considers himself more of a learner than a teacher. Thank you to Richard. Thank you to all of the storytellers for your incredible stories. Thank you to the audience for coming. Stick around if you want to do some Q&A, but I know that we have some final words. <coughs> so uh, thank, 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 thank you, everyone. You. I just want to put out some, uh, some nice thank yous to everyone, um, all of our storytellers. We had Angela and the captain and Scott. Susan, myself, and of course, our guest storytellers, uh, Danusia, Richard, and Nina. Um, and thank you so much. It was really a great experience. And I just want to mention that, um, you know, we, us group uh, of the UUCSR storytellers, we're part of a larger group um, that uh, under uh, Tracy's tutelage. And um, I just wanted to give a shout out to all the other amazing storytellers that were part of our group. There just wasn't enough time for everyone to tell their story. Um, but thank you so much to Ken Hughes, Richard Bach, Meg Cohen, Ruth O'Shea, Achella De Silva, Sandra Frank, um, all of which were there when we were doing our, our weekly workshops with Tracy um, and all have amazing stories to tell. And I hope you all hear them uh, someday. Um, and also, I just want to give much gratitude to our sort of events producers and promoters, which were Scott Barbet and Jen Sapel. Um, and finally, um, we would not be here today without the guidance of our fearless storytelling mentor, Tracy Seguera. Um, thank you so much, Tracy, for helping us find our inner storyteller. And I encourage you all to uh, go to Tracy's website for more information, to see some clips of her amazing stories and learn all about her at tracyseguera.com. Uh, she's an amazing storyteller. And I hope maybe next time we'll get you to tell one. <laughs> and uh, so, anyway, so anyway, with that, um, if people are free to go um, or if people want to, anybody who wants to stay on uh, for a little Q&A with all our storytellers, we'll stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and Let's, let's go. <laughs> yeah, Rebecca, I think you wanted to, um, like, this may, this is hopefully going to happen in the fall again. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, I think, we I think we did mention it earlier, but um, we do hope this to be um, at least an annual event, um, if not twice, twice a year. So stay tuned. Um, and we're hoping maybe for the fall to do another one. 
and then another one uh, the following year. So stay tuned for more story uh, storytelling from The Rock. I don't know what the theme will be next time, but uh, we do hope this to be a regular thing, so. Awesome. And if anybody would like to ask a question of any of the storytellers, if you could, you could either raise your virtual hand or you could write your question in the chat and Rebecca will read it and we'll direct it to whoever. Oh, and Stories from the Rock should be in person in the fall. Awesome. Yay. Nothing like a live audience. <laughs> Not that you guys are live, but that we can actually be in the same room with you. <laughs> Does anybody have any questions for the storytellers or their stories? Nothing is enough at all. Yeah. All right. Sometimes that happens. Thank you so much, all of you. It was an amazing experience to work with this group of storytellers and the storytellers who came on, my professional storytellers. Thank you for sharing your stories with us. Um, like I said, stories are the thread that connects us as human beings. And it is just such a beautiful thing to, to hear everybody's stories and to listen, you know? I think the more we can listen to each other, um, the better off the world will be. So thank you so much to the congregation, to all of you. Have a beautiful night, and I hope to see you in person in the fall, and everybody go to the congregation. They're so wonderful. Um, join them there also in Shelter Rock. Take care, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.